This video was originally recorded at the annual Buddhism and Psychotherapy program held at Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Okay. So I am so happy. Welcome, Mark. Thank Back you, Back again Bob. here at Menla. Pleasure. Here we are in front of Medicine Buddha. And uh, Mark is the doctor. And I'm just his one really failed case. <laughs> <laughs> He's always trying to help me out. Analyzing <laughs> my, my writings and things, but can't get to the bottom of it. But anyway, I'm really happy to have you here, Mark. And uh, addiction, trauma. Mm -hmm. Depression. Uh, juicy stuff. What? Depression, anxiety. Yes, I've been reading. I haven't, I haven't, I got started reading his new book, which is really interesting. I can finally have a chance to analyze him now, really. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's becoming more, uh, more self revelatory, Open. I think, in your yeah. stage as a writer, right? Yeah. This is what, your fifth book? Seventh. Sixth? Seventh book? Mm. Wow. So you're getting tired of writing so now you're having I, I, I have nothing left to mind your but, heart. but my own That's really experience. great. Yeah. That's very important. Trying. You have to open the heart, you know. Yeah. We do. Will I you learned do how the... to say happy birthday in German. How do you say it? Recently. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Heartfelt good luck wishes. No. Nice. That's what you say. You don't say happy birthday. Uh -huh. Say it again. What? Say it again. <laughs> Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Hmm. It sounds like salad, I know. <laughs> no, it's, but, it, but they like my pronunciation. It sounds nicer. What? As you, it sounds nicer as you repeat Herzlichen, it. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, yeah. you know. One tends to oversell it, you know, mm. when you don't know really how to do it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I don't want to be irrelevant. Will you, will no, you I open, want to turn no, the floor over to you. Will you open the refuge tree for me? Okay, you refuge, all right, meditate? I will if you ask me. Yeah. Okay, let's go, meditate. You guys are yogis. <laughs> Come on, let's meditate. Go into meditation mode. You can stay in the chair if you're in a chair. Cross your ankles. Uh, either put your hands in a, what's called a vajra fist with a thumb inside and put them on your thighs there or link them up, whichever way. Sit up straight, back straight, shoulders down, chin slightly tucked, mouth closed, eyes half closed, not shut, half closed and um, looking down your nose and, um, and like a little string on the very crown of your head, like sort of tugging your, to it to be over the spine and all the way straight down to the pelvis. That's the way it should be. Okay. And um, now here we are at Menla. And uh, we're going to do the Menla special Menla meditation. Menla means medicine Buddha, which is uh, this blue colored Buddha here. And the legend is that the Buddha turned blue when he taught the Buddhist teaching of medicine. It's either psychological or physical or both interwoven with each other. And what it is is first you now turn your attention back into your own face and into your mind and body, so to speak. And you are trying to find your real self. Like who is it who's doing this meditation? Who or what? So you turn back to look inside yourself to find yourself, sort of. And if you have a little perspicacity in your meditation, this will make you a little bit dizzy. And that's okay. Because you, in other words, you don't immediately find something. There's no little homunculus in your brain. At least the neuroscientists haven't found it yet. <laughs> and there's in your heart or somewhere. That's a little mini you, you know, owning you, you know, owning the maxi you. No. You don't see anything right away, so you, when you turn your gaze backward into yourself, sort of imaginatively, so you feel a little dizzy, so it's okay. Use that dizziness to let yourself kind of drop out of your usual sort of sense of constructed identity 
of being the you that's there doing whatever according to your usual self-narrative. And as you a little bit drop out of that identity, just, just subtly, you leave your external identity about the world, picture of what it is, the room and the building and the location and the planet. And you forget about the good news from DC today. And you just, whatever that is, there's some kind of ghost wandering somewhere. And you ignore it. And then you decide to arise from this free space of not upholding a specific fixed identity, habitual identity, in your ideal meditating identity, poised, balanced, energized, calm, aware, alert, And then you imagine that in the sky above you, which is sunny time of day, and there are fluffy clouds, but it's a sunny day, and there's a big tree, giant big tree, like Jack and the Beanstalk type of tree, growing from a, some distance in front of you, high into the sky. And in that tree, in the bowl of that tree, crown of that tree, there's a medicine Buddha, fully enlightened, what you imagine to be a fully enlightened being. And that being is smiling specifically at you because that being is very happy that you're trying to meditate. And around that being are maybe all the teachers you have ever had your shrink, if you've had one, your school teachers, your spiritual mentors, your parents, if they were your teachers, your guru, if you had one, lama, roshi, whatever, priest, minister, rabbi, some beings in history that you learned something from that are really great, they're all there in their Obi-Wan, Kenobi, sort of light holographic bodies surrounding the Medicine Buddha, all sitting on lotus seats in the, in the branches of this giant tree, like a host. And then even above the tree, on there's a bunch of other like angelic beings on clouds. And this whole host is looking down at you, smiling away, and really pleased. And from the Radiant smiles, the light rays flow out, and all rainbow color, blue, red, uh, that is sapphire, ruby, diamond, crystal, emerald, topaz, all the primary colors, and yellow and green, flow down to you like sort of liquid, coherent, light ray, nectar, and flow into you, flow into your crown of your head, fill your body with light, slip through the bones and the flesh and the brain and the whatever, and your neurons, and they fill you up with pure light energy. And your worries and your doubts and your sense, of your nagging fears, like what am I doing this for? whatever, they'll just float away like shadows, fleeing the light. And then you notice that around you, in a, at your level, a little bit maybe below you, in a vast field or around you, you're surrounded by another host of beings. And uh, in the front rows on the left side are all your loved ones, whether past or still alive the ones you love, they're all there, smiling, with delight seeing you, poised and alert and seeing you illuminated, kind of. And you're happy when you see the light you fill up with kind of overflowing toward them. 
and, and blessing them with that kind of light and energy and positive feelings and so on. And then, and then in the front row, sort of just straight ahead of you, are lots of beings that you know, but they're not close loved ones, and they're also not enemies or anything awful. They're just acquaintances. And they, however, look and please to see you, who they've noticed in the hallways, or they see you somewhere at work, you know, or they know you in the street, see you shining, and they feel the light flowing, reflecting toward them. And they're intrigued, and they're happy also. And then the front rows on the right are the ones you'd rather not think about. Your enemies, the disgraced, Bannon, <laughs> the old left, the old right, crazy prez, they're all there. And uh, anybody in the past, you know, Hitler, Genghis Khan, <laughs> everybody, all really bad ones that you can think of, worst kind, all of them. And they don't like you normally, and you sure don't like them. And yet, they're kind of intrigued seeing you shining. And they're sort of happy to grub away at your light themselves. Although they don't wish you well for it and they feel jealous. But they're in a way happy. And you see them at first with great aversion. But when you see it and you, you know their game too of trying to snatch your energy, vampire up your energy, but in a way, you're receiving such a flow of blessing from all enlightened beings, all your lifelong teachers, mental and spiritual and every kind, that you don't feel any scarcity of the light. So it shines on them. You kind of hope it sort of makes them feel a little less aggressive towards you, maybe something like that. And you're happy almost to see if they might relax a little. Their hostility in you think of those great spiritual teachers in history who said, love your enemies. And you realize they meant only that you wish that those unpleasant beings were happy so they wouldn't bother to be so unpleasant. So they were actually giving you practical advice. So you, this is the field in which you can focus on whatever it is that you want to learn in this retreat, or I like to call it an advance, and, uh, and also in your general meditations in life. You create a setting like this that's sort of ultimately supportive, and also in which your motivation is for those around you at the same time as yourself, as you acknowledge that you're at whatever your state is, it reflects out as a vibe, so to speak, or a light toward others, or a darkness or a bad vibe to them. So you want to, you feel that there's something in it for them, for you to feel better, for you to transform yourself positively. And then you realize how much you have benefited in this life from all your different teachers. If you didn't happen to ever meet Medicine Buddha, maybe you don't know if you benefited, but you can find some, Socrates, Maimonides, you know, Moses, Krishna, somebody. You benefited from someone's blessing. Your parents, your teachers, your friends. So this is sort of creating a, what I kind of call, the Tibetans call the tree of refuge. Tsokshin, the refuge field or refuge tree. I call it the, the, um, Shrine space, you know, like when you go into a shrine of whatever tradition, you feel a kind of feeling of holiness there and you feel like something special there. And sometimes you make a space like that in your house where you kind of go to collect yourself. You feel supported in that space. And so, so that's what, you know, temples and things are about.
their kind of like spiritual womb where you go to be reborn in a little better <coughs> psychophysical state. And this is sort of the Menla special. And actually, in, if you learn to use this kind of setting uh, method that is very, very integral to Tibetan Buddhist practice, most different versions, you, at the end of the meditation, you go through a thing, which I'm not saying to do now, but you go through a thing where you imagine that the heavenly host of teachers and beings that are benefactors, that they melt into pure light. They're so pleased with you at whatever progress you made in your five minute or 10 minute or 20 minute meditation deepening and calming and understanding. And uh, they just, so happy they just melt into pure light and they flow down and they, they merge with your heart so that they're sort of always there even whether you pay attention or not, you get the feeling they're with you. But then you don't want to hog them up just for yourself. So you then imagine that you melt into light and you dedicate what you meditated on for the sake of all the beings around you to improve their condition. And you flow out as pure light and you melt with them, merge with them, their heart. It does, you don't have to, they don't have to thank you, you don't have to, you know, it's, it's just your, your visualization, your imagination. But it's a good omen because it kind of rehearses how at least the Buddhist people think that beings who have become enlightened do actually bless all beings. They, they have the ability to, because they don't perceive a difference between themselves and the beings. They've come to expand their sense of identity, their sense of empathy, to feel they are one with all the beings. And so they, they want to be one with them as a kind of light to them. Light to them. they don't have to perceive the other being as that they just perceive it in themselves, but the enlightened being wants them wants to reinforce that for them by melting for them something like that. So when you come on retreat at Menla for one of our spiritual type retreats yoga retreat, psychology retreat, dharma retreat, then it's nice if you open this field and you can keep it open the whole time you're here. When you sleep, you feel that the benefactors are there when you wake up. You know, they'll have watched over you when you sleep and when you wake up, they greet you to a day of further self-exploration self-understanding, self-liberation. And uh, then you can close it when you leave and have a sense of taking with you some sort of positive blessing, if you like. You know? Or you can dissolve it at the end of each brief meditation. Ding! Oh, I have a little bell. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mark, mm. do you have some newspapers for us? I have them hi hidden here. <laughs> you don't have to do newspapers, mm. whatever yeah. you like. So happy you're here. I always love being here. Thank you. Did you get water from Mark? Small favor, um, if people could turn their phones off, um, we're streaming this on Facebook. And if you get um, messages while we're streaming, it slows it down. Thanks. I have to turn my phone off. Um, this is a very special uh, opportunity for, for me to be here with Bob, who I consider one of, my, um, one of the people up there in that tree for me. 
um, sitting there with my therapist and Freud and Winnicott and the Medicine Buddha and uh, the Historical Buddha and um, various other teachers of mine. Um, so it's very, very special for me to be here with you, Thank you. and with all of you. Um, and I hope that it turns out to be a good experience for you. It, it's this Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. It's a nice time, especially in this place. And I think the, the weather will be nice, um, at least for part of tomorrow and Sunday. Uh, but I think of you up there with, for me, too, in the linear, then Freud and Winnicott yeah. behind you and Freud. And, and me. All kinds yeah. of what it's like. Dharma yeah. Kitty. Well, the bringing together the, the psychology and, uh, and spirituality, you know, which is something particular uh, for our time or happening again in our time. I think it hap it's been happening since the time of the Buddha, actually. Um, but as, it's a special time for all of us to have these days when we can let the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, let the Dharma percolate a little bit in our uh, uh, subjective experience and in our interpersonal experience. So um, we're not going to do a classic silent meditation retreat where it's all internal, but um, uh, hopefully it's a time of actually being able to integrate uh, um, what the Buddhist teachings are w with your psychology and with your, uh, with your regular life. That's what I'm uh, hopeful for. For th those of you who are not familiar with me, uh, I'm a, a psychiatrist, a therapist, but I had the uh, fortunate experience of being introduced to Buddhism, exposed to Buddhism, learning about Buddhism uh, before I knew very much about anything else. Early on, in, for me in college, the first classes that I took, uh, um, I wasn't really looking to learn about Buddhism, but it was there. And it touched something in me, woke, woke something up in me that uh, I continued to pursue. Um, and uh, uh, I came from a, um, a, a family where academic, uh, academic life was sort of the religion that I grew up with, more than, than Judaism or any other kind of religion. My father was a, um, a, a doctor, an academic physician, a, a scientific materialist, as Bob likes to talk about, um, who I uh, really never talked to about my, uh, Buddhism or about my spiritual pursuits, or, although he was very proud of my books and always kept uh, a copy of each one of them on his desk. Uh, until um, he was in his mid-80s and uh, came down with a brain tumor, uh, like John McCain, the same brain tumor as John McCain. Uh, he had a brain tumor on the non-dominant side of his brain so that he cognitively was intact um, uh, and knew what was happening uh, uh, as a doctor, uh, but it was discovered too late to do anything about. So I had my first conversation with him uh, about my spiritual uh, uh, beliefs uh, on the telephone from my office when he was newly diagnosed, but before he passed away. And it was inspired by the meditation that, uh, that we just did together, because I always like it when uh, Bob does that meditation. It was new to me. It's coming from the Tibetan tradition, not from the the Vipassana Theravada Buddhist tradition is what I've spent most of my meditative time in. Um, but I, I all of a sudden was filled with this kind of urgency in talking to my dad, uh, because what, you know, what have I learned, actually? That's in, in terms of the books that I'm writing, uh, I'm always trying to articulate, uh, have I really learned anything from either of these worlds that have so influenced me, the, the Buddhist meditation world or the psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis, psychodynamic world? Um, so I wanted to try to tell my father what, uh, what I had picked up about uh, what might be helpful as he passed uh, from this life. And I remember framing it something like this, which was, um, you, you know that feeling that you've had from when you were young, like when you were 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, you don't feel your age from the inside, you just sort of know that you're you. 
Um, it's sort of akin to the beginning of the meditation when you were saying, you know, turn your, turn your attention backwards, uh, trying to find your own face. That feeling, uh, that sort of invisible feeling, the subjective sense of yourself as you, that if you really try to find it, it makes you a little dizzy, as Bob was saying, but, but you, yet you know that you're you. You, you haven't... As your, even though your physical form has been changing, there's an ongoing sense of something, you know, that's you. So I suggested to my father that what, the, what I had learned from Buddhism was that if you uh, uh, relax your mind into that sort of invisible space, that that's the place that you can ride out the um, falling away of the body. And... Um, he listened to me very uh, kindly, I would say, quietly, attentively, and, uh, um, and then said, um, uh, okay, darling, I'll try. And, uh, and I thought he was really, it was a good, you know, I felt good about it. Um, and then uh, nine years ago, I think, he, he died in his, own emergen in his own intensive care unit because even though the a brain tumor had spread beyond where they could do anything about it. They insisted on biopsying it. And uh, then he got an infection from the biopsy and, and uh, went down. Um, but I had a, a, a reading. I wouldn't talk about this in most company, but I had a psychic reading with a, um, a medium who, uh, whose work I uh, respect a lot, a woman named Laura Lynn Jackson, uh, about five years ago. And uh, she uh, goes into that refuge tree and, and feels the energy of the various people who are up there who are tuned into your uh, psychic development. And the first thing she said to me on the telephone was, oh, your father's here. And uh, he says to tell you that you were right. <laughs> he said, I, then she said, he says uh, he thought he was smart before, but where he is now, he's really smart. Which sounded like my father. Um, if he want, whenever he wants to know something in this place, uh, he can just know it instantly. Um, so that's an aside, actually. For, uh, but it sort of shows you where I'm coming from. The uh, the Buddhist world is the sound. You, you can adjust it, right? It's sort of bouncing around. If I can do anything from here, let me know. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, the Buddhist world touched me, as I was saying before, uh, when I was still in college, and I, re I was reading Buddhism, and it was um, uh, making the most sense to me. I had the vague notion that, uh, that career-wise I was going to be a therapist, because I knew I was good at sitting and listening, and I liked people. And it seemed like work that wasn't really work, which, which appealed to me, um, <laughs> which I think was true. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Western uh, uh, theory had, wasn't making sense to me yet. Uh, I, I did go to the university health services to uh, uh, see a therapist because I was troubled by a, a sense of uh, anxiety of some sort. Uh, and I... I uh, had a therapist for three sessions who was an expert in short-term uh, therapy who had me tell my story and then told me that, oh, yeah, you'll be okay. It's, this is just like an Oedipus complex that you're telling me about. Um, and I didn't really know what an Oedipus complex was at that point, but, um, but I felt sort of encouraged that my, you know, there was hope for me, that, I had a, uh, that my condition had a name, but, uh, but uh, didn't feel much better. Uh, uh, but shortly after that, I met my first real meditation teachers, uh, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, Sharon Salzberg. Um, and they were the people who taught me uh, uh, Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation. And their instruction to me right away was, you know, stop trying to find the why of what you're feeling and, and pay more attention to what you actually are feeling. Uh, and so that... Um, that drew me in and, uh, and I think gave me the, um, 
uh, the support that I needed to go on to go to medical school and then be trained as a psychiatrist and uh, have a career as a therapist and then try to write uh, these, uh, these books, you know, uh, bringing the worlds together. Because I think uh, um, where, wherever Buddhism has gone in its uh, 2,600, 2,500, 2,600-year 2, uh, career, it's always moved from culture to culture by force of its ideas rather than by a conquering army. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it's moved from culture to culture, it's been retranslated all the time by whoever the, uh, um, the holders of the, uh, uh, the current culture you know, had to interpret uh, Buddhist thought into the culture that was already there. So the Chinese, for instance, you, who already had a Taoist uh, philosophy reinterpreted Buddhism uh, through a Taoist lens, and something new came out in <laughs> in, um, in China. Uh, in our country, you know, the um, uh, the holders of the lineage of the mind, at least for the past hundred years, have been the psychoanalysts. So that language of psychoanalysis, even if we don't believe in Freud anymore, um, is still the way most of us think about our own personal psychologies. You know, the idea that our early childhoods mold who we are, um, that's now being uh, kind of uh, the, this idea of the brain uh, as molding who we are is being superimposed upon the psychoanalytic view, but it's, you know, that's sort of what one's morphing into the other. Um, but I, I felt that the, uh, the way I needed to understand Buddhism was through the lens of psychology. Uh, and so that language is, is what I've tried to speak as I've been um, uh, doing my work, both as a therapist and as a writer. So for our weekend, trying to make this relevant for uh, issues like addiction and anxiety and depression and so on, um, I want to make it clear right from the beginning that we're not trying to replace uh, strategies, therapies that we know work from a Western point of view, like you know AA, uh, like medication, like psychotherapy. Um, we're trying to talk about what the Buddhist uh, psychology can bring in a kind of complementary way to uh, uh, those those kinds of issues and those kinds of treatments. Um, so we, I, I want to encourage all of you, something's bringing you here, whether it's any of those three supposed topics or uh, something more uh, mysterious or complicated or simple. Um, over the weekend, feel free to talk uh, uh, here in these sessions, taking the risk of uh, embarrassing yourself, uh, uh, knowing that whatever you bring up will probably be relevant to lots of other people who are here. It's sometimes hard in these kinds of settings, just like it is in an individual psychotherapy, to uh, actually say the things that are bothering you or worrying you or are in your mind. But we, we know from therapy that, that that's what's helpful, is when it actually gets uh, aired and talked about. So uh, Bob made reference already that uh, I've been working on a book for the past couple of years, which uh, we just have the galleys of it now. It's coming out in January. And the, the title is uh, Advice Not Given, and the subtitle is uh, A Guide to Getting Over Yourself. And the, the um, Advice Not Given, the real inspiration for that title, came to me when I was on a, a, a week-long meditation retreat, when I realized that in, in some way over the, it's probably 30 years that I've been a therapist now, um, in, in some way I've been keeping the Buddhism uh, a little bit close to my chest or vest or whatever, whatever the expression is. Uh, I've been keeping it a little bit uh, close to me, uh, not wanting to lay it on the people who have come to see me as patients. Um, you know, trying to sort of sneak it in when it was relevant, uh, but, but not talking about it overtly, except when, you know, it was really obvious to me that somebody really wanted it, and that's why they were coming to me, even though I was writing all these books about it and so on. Uh, and that, but then I, I, and I thought, okay, you know, I'm being a good therapist and so on. Um, but on this retreat, I suddenly was like, oh, the, 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 
the phrase actually came to me, advice not given, and I was like, maybe I've been like not giving uh, enough of what has actually helped me so much to the people that I really care about who are my patients, um, so maybe I should start to try to talk about it a little bit more. Um, and then the editor who I brought the idea to, uh, who I sent the book to chapter by chapter, so sometimes she would be like, oh yeah, this is good, and sometimes she would be, you know, this is really not good, and she would send it back to me with a line or two telling me what she thought it needed, and she, I always thought she was right. Um, she really encouraged me to um, come from a place of uh, being, having been a therapist for 30 years, so to not, uh, I tended to write before from, oh yeah, when I was 20 years old and I discovered Buddhism, this is what, the, you know, it was such a revelation because I saw that I wasn't who I thought I was and you know, I could start to uh, experience myself in a deeper way. Um, so I was comfortable writing about it from a beginner's perspective, but she really wanted to hear my voice as the you know, a, a supposedly mature therapist who's been working with people for all these years uh, and working with myself. So I tried to write from that place. Um, so I'm going to try to talk from that place also, although you could hear already I was going back to uh, when I first discovered Buddhism. Um, so the, the way I'm thinking about things now is that um, there are basically three developmental challenges, I would say, or tasks um, that someone who wants to uh, conquer their addictions, anxieties, depressions, or whatever else themselves, uh, there, there are three developmental challenges that we all face that are not necessarily, I have to present them one, two, three, but it's not necessarily like a ladder, like one comes first and then the next and then the next, but actually I think there's, there are three interlocking challenges that the um, uh, techniques uh, or perspectives of both Buddhism and Western psychoanalytic psychotherapy, which is what's influenced me, uh, although I could talk about it as cognitive behavioral, whatever, if you need me to. Um, uh, the, these three tasks or challenges can be approached from either side, and they appear a little bit different depending which side you want to look at them from, but I think they're after the same thing. So the, the first one, uh, I would say, traditionally falls into the domain of psychotherapy, but Buddhism has a lot to say about it, and that is that we have to believe in ourselves. Um, that there's a, an underlying tendency in many of us to disparage who we are, um, to um, feel there are a lot of words that, uh, that we could use, uh, inadequate, which would play into the um, Oedipus complex that that first therapist was uh, telling me I was suffering from, uh, inadequate, uh, unworthy, um, no good, uh, empty, empty in a bad way, like nothing to offer, um, unlovable, uh, um, unworthy, I think I said already. Anyway, you sort of get the picture. Uh, low self-esteem, no self-regard, uh, a sense of being less than, uh, worried about oneself, uncomfortable, uh, uh, you know, a kind of shyness that, uh, is that where the sense of not knowing how to meet another person in a full way. Um, I remember early on, we, there used to be these conferences about Buddhism and psychotherapy 20, 30 years ago, and a, a well-respected Lama, Gelek Rinpoche, uh, who, who Bob knows well, was there. And I was training as a psychiatrist in those days at a, a mental hospital that specialized in the treatment of borderline personality. It had, in those days, there was good insurance. 
and they had a, um, a long-term unit that people with borderline personality, I can explain what that is for the non-therapists here, um, not crazy people, but people who had trouble uh, uh, regulating their affect, we say now, regulating their emotions. Uh, uh, people who, um, often young women, but not always, who uh, felt a sort of crippling kind of emptiness and would tend to um, uh, hurt themselves, cut themselves, make suicidal gestures. Uh, they had a long-term unit at this hospital uh, where people would come for eight months, nine months, a year and where the, uh, the young therapist would routinely be seduced by the, uh, by the, by the patients um, <laughs> and, then, and then have to leave the hospital. Um, uh, anyway, I remember asking Gail Gale Rinpoche, is the emptiness that these so-called borderline patients, because I secretly was afraid that I was borderline also, <laughs> because my theory was everyone was borderline, and, we, I, we can talk about that more as the week, if, if, if you're worried about that, too. Um, I remember asking him, is this emptiness, is there any relationship between this emptiness and the Buddhist emptiness that you're always talking about? Um, and if you don't know yet that Buddhists always talk about emptiness by the end, I promise you by the end of this weekend, we will have talked a lot about emptiness. And um, he, he gave me a great answer, which was, uh, do you know what, what's that thing that, uh, that blacksmiths uh, hit against? And that's what, it, yes, that's what he said, what's that thing? And then someone said, an anvil. Blacksmith? A blacksmith hits against an anvil. Oh. You know an anvil, you know. And it, the blacksmith hits a hammer against an anvil. Oh, right, right, right. He said, These, this is like untrained minds hitting against the anvil of emptiness. You, you know, but they're not stable, their minds are not stable enough to hold the truth. So they, so they turn it, you, you know, they, they sense it a little bit, but then turn it against themselves. And I thought it was a very good answer. Um, so this first challenge or task that, uh, that I see for many of us, uh, this, in Buddhism they talk about the, the precious human birth, um, that how, how much effort it has taken to achieve this life, the, this body, this mind, a mind that is capable of meditation, a mind that can bring us here, a mind that is actually capable of reaching enlightenment. Uh, uh, the opportunity, there are a lot of stories, uh, of fables about what kinds of effort it's taken to achieve this precious opportunity. So I, I think about that in relationship to the, um, uh, the usual psychotherapeutic uh, task of building up a patient's ego, building up their self-esteem. Um, the, a friend of ours, uh, uh, another early Buddhist psychologist, Jack Engler, had a famous phrase, uh, you have to be somebody before you can be nobody. Um, and he took, he took some criticism for that because he was um, saying it in a kind of stepwise way that psychotherapy has to come first. You know, you have to build up your self-esteem, your self-regard, et cetera, before you, before you can meditate, before you can unravel the self and understand what we really mean by emptiness. You have to have a secure enough base. Um, and... Uh, uh, what was wrong about that was that even people who were borderline personality and suffering from terrible feelings of low self-esteem and self-loathing could meditate and could get a lot out of meditation and could learn how to pull away from the gross identification with those feelings. But he still was saying something that also had a lot of truth in it, which was one of the main challenges we face is to have enough uh, self-regard, that we have a secure base, enough trust and experience to um, uh, deal with the complexity of what it really means to be a person in a body, in a life now. Um, the, the Buddha in his uh, first psychological teachings, when he taught the Four Noble Truths, the first truth that he taught was just a single word, which was dukkha. And uh, uh, dukkha, as I've learned uh, in these uh, uh, times at Menla, 
Uh, it's usually translated as suffering. It's sometimes translated as unsatisfactoriness. But the, if you take the word apart, it actually means hard to face. It means hard yeah. to face, dukkha. right? Dukkha. Uh, easy to face, <clears throat> sweet to face would be sukha, which you mean, you know comes to mean happiness or joy. Dukkha, unpleasantness, hard to face. So one of the things about being a human being is that we're all carrying aspects of ourselves, experiences that from the Western psychological place we might put into our childhood to a time before we can really remember. So where do all these negative feelings come from? Or maybe we put it in the, from an uh, evolutionary biological place. We talk about it as uh, you know, our, our primitive brains from when we were uh, fighting uh, the dragons of uh, uh, the, the primeval, primeval world and, and we're wired with uh, fight or flight. You know, with, so that we, we're sitting on these angry uh, or in some cases erotic uh, impulses that are stronger than we are and threaten to overtake us. Uh, w one of the tasks of this first, you, you know, building up enough faith in oneself that one believes in one's uh, beauty and uh, wisdom uh, uh, is to be able to deal with uh, uh, all of these not, not so uh, pleasant aspects of ourselves. And um, the psychoanalysts are very good about this. So one of my favorite uh, uh, things that I want to read is from a, a friend and colleague of mine named Michael Eigen, who's one of the only uh, sort of uh, mystical psychoanalysts that are around, who's an expert. He's an expert in uh, a couple of important uh, British uh, psychoanalysts from the 40s and 50s. One of them, uh, uh, a man named Bion, W.R. Bion, who, from whom I stole the phrase thoughts without a thinker for my first book. That, was, that came out of Bion's writing. Uh, and, and Bion had the um, good fortune to be Samuel Beckett's analyst when, when Beckett was a young and troubled man. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a little thing I like to read from Michael Eigen writing about Bion. But it's about this, what I'm trying to talk about. I think Bion is trying to describe the worst in us, he says. And I think he is trying to do something more. I feel he is saying we must and can survive the worst if we are to be truly compassionate with ourselves and each other. If we're going to be partners with the capacities that constitute us. One of the great experiences in reading Bion, I think, is that over and over we come through the worst. We survive ourselves, build up tolerance for ourselves, make room for ourselves. In the face of the worst that he can experience or envision experiencing, including total destruction of experience, Bion maintained a faith that openness to the unknowable ultimate reality of a session, a psychotherapy session, of a moment, of a lifetime, is somehow linked with growth processes. I think that Bion must have been close to destroying every possibility of goodness in life, and that he speaks from his own experience of surviving the great destruction. I think he must have discovered for himself that life erupts in the valley of the shadow of death. I think Bion always had an eye on the backcloth of destruction. He always was facing the horror of himself, a faith that in spite of all horrors, experience is worthwhile, is different from use of faith to avoid experiencing. The faith beyond fought for was linked to intensity of living and risk of openness. Really nice. So there's a lot of phrases in there that uh, um, percolate inside of me and that to me speak to, uh, again, what this weekend is about and how these worlds come together. Um, one of them is uh, to become partners with the capacities that constitute us. So uh, um, that, I think, to me means that we don't use meditation, for instance, to just um, suppress our so-called destructive or toxic uh, uh, emotions. 
that we actually, that we, that we not be afraid of them, even though they do have the capacity to destroy us, uh, that we make room, as uh, he says in here, that we make room for ourselves, that we become tolerant of ourselves, that we experience the entire range, including the horror of ourselves, and that uh, learning how to do that, and it is something that one learns how to do, and I think both therapy and meditation uh, work together to teach us how to do that, that that gives us a, a different kind of faith, but an important kind of faith than the way we usually think about faith. And, that, and that's this final phrase, you know, um, uh, a faith that in spite of all horrors, experience is worthwhile different from the use of faith to avoid experiencing. So I think that's a sort of swipe at conventional religion where uh, faith becomes a kind of buffer against the, the, uh, who we are when we leave the chapel or when we leave the church, that what we're looking for here is a, this kind of uh, uh, openness, tolerance, compassionate attitude, but not necessarily an indulgence of uh, the, the worst in us. And that's where the Buddha comes in with his famous middle way, you know, which is not trying to eradicate, but also not indulging. And, that, and that's, uh, I think, what we're going to try to cultivate here. Now, I don't know if Bion was the influence on Beckett uh, that I like to imagine he was, but, but in the work of Beckett, uh, I think we, you, we can feel the same kind of thing operating. And um, this is a nice little thing about Beckett from a book called, it's uh, about Samuel Beckett oh. from a book called Daily Rituals. But it's just another way of saying the same thing. In 1946, Beckett began a period of intense creative activity that he would later refer to as the siege in the room. Over the next few years, he would produce his finest work, the novels Malloy and Malone Dies, and the play that would make him famous, Waiting for Godot. Beckett's life during this siege is described as follows. It was spent largely in his room, isolated from the world, coming face to face with his own demons, attempting to explore the workings of his mind. His routine was for the most part simple enough. He would rise around the early hours of the afternoon, make himself scrambled eggs, and retire to his room for as many hours as he could bear. He would then leave for his late night perambulation of the bars of Montparnasse, drinking copious amounts of cheap red wine, returning before dawn and the long attempt to sleep. His entire life revolved around his almost psychotic obsession to write. This siege began with an epiphany. On a late night walk near Dublin Harbor, Beckett found himself standing on the end of a pier in the midst of a winter storm. Amid the howling wind and churning water, he suddenly realized that the dark he had struggled to keep under in his life and in his writing, which had until then failed to find an audience or meet his own aspirations, should in fact be the source of his creative inspiration. I shall always be depressed, Beckett concluded, but what comforts me is the realization that I can now accept this dark side as the commanding side of my personality. In accepting it, I will make it work for me. So he might not have gotten enlightened, but maybe he was enlightened. We don't know. So, so that's the first challenge, this sense of like being able to work with the negativity, basically, uh, not try to eradicate it, but sort of find the life within it and all, use it to train uh, the, the great gift of this mind that we all uh, are in possession of. The second task uh, is, I think, traditionally in the domain of meditation, the idea that it's possible to actually calm the mind, to find some kind of inner peace, as the Dalai Lama always talks about. Um, that first course that I took in Buddhism um, the, uh, the text that we read there that, that sort of woke me up in the first place was uh, called the Dhammapada, and it's a collection of Buddhist verse that was written for lay people, not for the monks. So it's in a kind of um, inspiring verse. Um, 
and there was a translation that uh, uh, was available in those days uh, from a, a Bengali scholar uh, that uh, um, I think was a particularly good translation. There's a verse in it called simply Mind, and it went like this, it describes this um, uh, uh, calming of the mind that's possible through meditation. Like an archer and arrow, the wise man steadies his trembling mind, a fickle and restless weapon. Flapping like a fish thrown on dry ground, it trembles all day, struggling to escape from the snares of Mara the tempter. In the Buddhist uh, uh, iconography, Mara is like a, a great god uh, who sor sort of represents the ego. Um, many ways to look at Mara. Some would call him a devil. Stephen Batchelor calls him a devil, but he was actually a god. Uh, but I think uh, looked at psychologically, it's, it's the ego pulling on the Buddha, and the, and the Buddha is uh, constantly having conversation with Mara, both before his enlightenment and after his enlightenment. So, uh, but it was the flapping like a fish thrown on, on dry ground, trembling all day, struggling to escape that I related to at first. The mind is restless. To control it is good. A disciplined mind is the road to nirvana. Look to your mind, wise man. Look to it well. It is subtle, invisible, treacherous. A disciplined mind is the road to nirvana. So it was this, this translation, you know, like subtle, invisible, treacherous, like beautiful. <laughs> then it goes on. Swift, single, nebulous. It sits in the cave of the heart. So that's again gets you this like looking backward, trying to find your own face, you know, that thing I was trying to tell my dad. Swift, single, nebulous. Like, what does that mean? It sits in the cave of the heart. In Buddhist psychology, the mind goes between the heart and the and the head, between the heart and the brain. Who conquers it frees himself from slavery. No point calling him wise whose mind is unsteady, who is not serene who does not know the Dharma. Call him wise, whose mind is calm, whose senses are controlled, who is unaffected by good and evil, who is wakeful. He knows the body for what it is, a frail jar. He makes his mind firm like a fortress. He attacks Mara with the weapon of wisdom. He guards what he conquers jealously. I like that too, but you could, you could still be jealous. It is not long before the body, bereft of breath and feeling, lies on the ground, poor thing, like a burnt out cinder. No hate can hurt, no foe can harm, as hurts and harms a mind ill-disciplined. Neither father, mother, nor relative, or I would say therapist, can help as helps a mind that is well-disciplined. So this idea that it's possible, it's actually possible to discipline the mind like that, you, you know, uh, that's, that's something that uh, Buddhism knows well, that uh, Freud, I think, in his own explorations, cocaine-fueled explorations of his own mind, came to understand, you, you know, his Freud's own instructions to therapists uh, if you abstract them from the, um, uh, the collected works of Sigmund Freud and hold them up next to Buddhist uh, meditation instruction, you couldn't tell the difference. You know, Freud wrote, uh, uh, suspend judgment and give impartial attention to everything there is to observe. Okay, you couldn't have a better meditation instruction than that. Suspend judgment and give impartial attention to everything there is to observe. In, um, in the Vipassana tradition of, of Buddhism, which is very good at uh, laying out the practicalities of how to do meditation from the beginning, they divide uh, meditation strategies into basically two camps. The first is concentration, and the second is mindfulness. And it's, I found it very helpful to uh, have that spelled out for me. I don't know how sophisticated all of you are in the worlds of meditation, but uh, concentration meditations are basically 
you set up a central object, like the sensation of the breath is what's traditionally used in many Buddhist uh, uh, traditions, but it's not the only one. It could be a mantra, like the repetition of a sound as, as one does doing transcendental meditation. Uh, it could be a visual image. Uh, it could be just the sounds that uh, 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 come to what's, what's traditionally called the ear door. Uh, but you, uh, doing concentration meditation, whenever you notice that your mind has wandered, you gently but firmly bring it back to the central object. So if you're trying to watch the breath, you pay attention to the sensation of the in-breath, you pay attention to the sensation of the out-breath, there's a little pause after the out-breath before the next in-breath comes. You might uh, feel your two lips touching or feel your, uh, where your body is held by the cushion or the chair. And then the mind, a fickle and restless weapon that it is, will, jumps away. Whenever you notice that the mind has jumped away, which could be four or five minutes later, or two or three thoughts later, you deliberately leave wherever the mind has gone and bring it back over and over again, like teaching a young child. Okay, That's a concentration meditation. Mindfulness meditation is you follow the mind where it goes. You follow the attention where it goes. So it gets a little tricky because uh, uh, there's a kind of... Uh, 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 we call it a therapeutic split in the ego in, uh, in psychoanalysis, but there's a split in the awareness uh, when you're practicing mindfulness because consciousness is ongoing, you know, the, the mind's experience is ongoing, but you have the capacity to like, look at it the, like, as if you're looking in a mirror, sort of. So you, with your own awareness, you can follow where your awareness is going, if that makes any sense. Um, so in mindfulness meditation, you might start with the breath, but then when uh, something clatters in the corner or the wind blows and your attention automatically goes there, you go with it. And then when you start to think, oh, well, this guy is really going on too long, you know, like, uh, what time are we going to go to sleep? You, you, um, you, you go with your thoughts. So you pay attention to the sort of the sensation of what it's like to be thinking rather than to the actual um, content of the thoughts because the thoughts are pretty repetitive, really. Uh, and then when your back starts to hurt and your attention is drawn there, you go to the raw physical sensation uh, of your back hurting. So you're sort of chasing, you're, you're following your mind uh, as it's roaming. And with, a, with enough concentration built up, that actually becomes possible. So uh, when you're practicing, like if you go on a meditation retreat for a week or two or three or whatever, uh, you'll toggle back and forth between doing the one-pointed concentration on a single object to build up a kind of stability of mind, and then you'll relax that uh, and let mindfulness take over. Uh, and uh, uh, with enough base to your practice, uh, you, you, instead of the mind swirling you around, you can actually start to follow it. So the traditional analogy that was given in the early Buddhist text was to a cow herd who has a big flock of cows, or whatever you call it, a big herd of cows. And uh, in, order to, in order to keep the cows within the pasture, at first you have to like, hit them with a stick and you know, like force them to listen to you. Um, but after a while, once the crops have been planted and you're not worried about the cows eating the young uh, plants that are growing and the cows sort of know their place, the cow herd can kind of lean against a post of just keep one eye open and, uh, and leave everything alone, but basically seeing that things stay in their place. So but mindfulness is like can be mindfulness and concentration together are like that cow herd. Sometimes you have to be prodding and poking and keeping your mind within the, uh, within the field. And sometimes you can just take what's called the backward step and uh, leave your mind alone, but there's still enough awareness there to follow it. So we'll, hopefully tomorrow um, we will do some of this together. Um, so, that's the, so that's the second task. The first task is to build up enough ego. I'll stop soon. Um, 
The second task is to learn to sort of calm things down. And then the, the third one uh, I've taken to calling taming the ego. Um, because when you really look at Buddhist psychology, and this is what, 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 why I'm so happy to be doing this kind of weekend, when you're really looking at Buddhist psychology, it, it's the taming the mind, the inner peace, the calming the thoughts, and so on, that's like just the beginning. That, that what, what we're really after is the root cause of suffering, the root cause of addiction, anxiety, and depression, the root cause of the dukkha that the Buddha talked about in the first noble truth. And that he gave various names to. Uh, when, sometimes when Bob teaches, he talks about the root cause as the uh, intrinsic identity instinct. And what, what? The intrinsic identity instinct. Habit. 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 Yeah. Sometimes you've said instinct. I, I say instinct because it comes out of Freud. <laughs> but the intrinsic identity habit. So maybe I can get you to talk about that a little bit. Other ways that it's talked about is just ignorance, ignorance or delusion. Okay. <laughs> But uh, in our language, psychological language, we would talk about it as ego. Okay? Uh, when the Buddha explained it in the second noble truth, he said that the, the cause is clinging or craving. So what, who is it that clings? What is it that clings? We would say it's the ego that clings. What do we mean by the ego that's clinging? Well, we're, we, we all intrinsically instinctually or habitually think of ourselves, we can't help but think of ourselves as uh, um, separate, alone. Uh, um, gets back to what I was talking about at the beginning, inadequate. Um, uh, needing to watch out for ourselves. You, you know, uh, ourselves as our first, obviously our first priority. And we're not totally wrong, or maybe we are actually completely wrong. Uh, but that habit is driving us. And the, uh, the, the, the Buddha, in his greater teachings, uh, uh, laid out what he called the Eightfold Path, which was uh, look at all the different domains of your experience and pay attention to how the ego is driving you. So, the Eightfold Path, right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Uh, when, in, when I've been thinking about this lately, I've been trying to take the, that prescription of the Eightfold Path and talk about how, that, how you could actually apply that in a, in a whole life. And uh, my... One of my inspirations for that uh, came uh, again from my old friend Jack Engler, who m m many years ago uh, uh, traveled to Bogaya, the, the village where the tree that the Buddha was enlightened under still uh, still uh, still is, uh, to study with a, a great teacher of Vipassana who taught Joseph Goldstein, a Bengali man named um, Anagarika Munindra, and. Uh, Jack Engler came to visit Manindra, who I, a teacher I also knew briefly, um, uh, to study meditation. And he came you know, on a Fulbright, uh, 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 eager, uh, um, uh, wanting to uh, uh, learn the right technique, wanting to calm his mind, wanting to find inner peace. And Manindra refused to teach him meditation, even though he was, a, he was renowned. He had like a, a, a photographic memory and knew all the Buddhist scriptures by heart, was renowned as a teacher of teachers. But he wouldn't teach uh, Jack Engler how to meditate. He would only talk to him about the state of his bowels, the state of <laughs> Jack's bowels. And um, uh, he took him to the marketplace to buy fleecy seed, which if you mixed with water was good if you had... Uh, if you were constipated, if you mixed it with yogurt, it was good if you had diarrhea. Uh, he uh, 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 in incessantly uh, engaged in this conversation for about a week with Jack. Um, I've later learned that in, in a certain Bengali culture that this way of uh, talking about your, the state of your bowels is like the way we talk about the weather, that it's just a way of sort of <laughs> like uh, 
um, you know, making friends. But Jack grew increasingly frustrated, wanted to learn how to meditate, had come all this way. Uh, and finally, uh, he and Manindra were out taking a walk uh, beside the Chinese temple in Bogaya. Uh, and and uh, Jack like, almost took him by the lapels you know, and said, Manindra, when are you going to teach me the Dharma? And Manindra was, like, looked puzzled and then sort of smiled and said, uh, said to him, the Dharma? You want to learn the Dharma? The Dharma means living the life fully. Okay. So uh, I think by, uh, unconsciously by only talking about his bowels, Manindra was uh, um, addressing the obsessive compulsive aspect of which, as we know from psychoanalysis, is rooted in the anal stage. Uh, of, uh, of Jack's particular psychology, you know, um, uh, because he wanted the technique, you know, and he wanted to do it right, um, and he wanted to clean up the, his mess. Um, but Manindra was giving him a bigger view, even though he was a Theravada Buddhist teacher, and you might not expect that he would have what we call a Mahayana view, but of course he did. Uh, and he wanted Jack to see and, and Jack knew, and he has spoken about it very movingly. He said, when Manindra said this, he knew he was saying something profound, but it didn't really penetrate. But he wrote it down in his notebook, and came, uh, you know, when he came back to America, finally, he would look at it over and over, and finally the, you know, the profundity of the comment started to impress itself upon his mind. But this idea of living the life fully, I think, brings the three uh, challenges together for me which is, you know, we have to uh, uh, experience ourselves in, in our own totalities with faith that we can survive the worst in us, that we have to have the discipline to uh, a, a attack our own minds, and that we have to apply what we learn in the depth of meditation. We have to apply it in our regular lives. Otherwise, we end up like the... Uh, the therapists who have to have sex with their patients, or like the Buddhist teachers who are really in it for you know power and prestige, or, or like the current White House inhabitants or whatever, you know, where we achieve a certain amount of uh, of uh, uh, wisdom or power. I, I don't mean to imply that about the current White House inhabitants, <laughs> but but you know what I'm getting at. But don't really put it into play and to practice in the actual life that we're living. So I think that's good enough as an introduction for the weekend. And maybe you have a response. Uh, yeah. So we only go, I think, till 9. Yeah. How long does So we only, we're nearly no, there. Oh, a little longer. And uh, maybe before we stop, I would like to ask everyone, how, how many of you are very knowledgeable about Buddhism? To start with, I'd like to ask. How many, like, very knowledgeable? It's, like, <laughs> it's not. How, how many of you are brand new? Raise your hand, you're not. <laughs> how, how many of you are, like, really brand new? So that, like, what Mark was talking about is, like, the first thing sort of that you've heard. So everybody, there's like hardly anybody brand new and hardly anybody very knowledgeable. <laughs> so where is everybody? Like in the middle way, I guess. Is that the middle way? Yes. <laughs> sort of. Well, wait. When what? You, when you ask if someone's very knowledgeable, it's hard to say that you are by comparison. No, no, no. So you could ask if someone is knowledgeable about Buddhism, and that might take the edge off. If someone, well, yeah, I mean, well, so everybody's knowledgeable then, I guess. There's very few Who's very familiar knowledgeable with the very, basics of very Buddhism? Very few brand new. I say, oh, wow. These people are familiar with the basics of Buddhism. Yeah, OK. So everybody knows what Mark is talking about, the Eightfold Path. No. He was listing. No. You know that, and the Four Noble Truths. And no. Do, how many of you who know? So you all know the Four Noble Truths? No. 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 So that's good. I just wanted to just be sure. A lot of no. Uh, what? A lot of people say no. Say no? Say no. Oh. Very a lot rusty. Of people, <laughs> So, but your whole book is about the Four Noble Truths. Or your Portuguese. whole book. Your books are about the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> you know, he has here right effort. And he knows, I notice you have in here, for some people you say it's called it realistic, but yes. I'm not doing that. 
There's a, there's a footnote. That's because you're traditional. You're very there's a traditional. footnote that says you. What? There's a footnote that mentions no, you. No, I know, I know. You, no, you put it in the main text, yeah. but you mentioned that some people do, but I'm saying right, right, right. Because that's traditional. You're being traditional. In the English translation, traditional. So the word is samyak. Samyak. Samyak means... Uh, you know, it means something authentic. It could be right. It's opposite is mitya, which could be false or wrong. So, uh, so that's okay. That's all right. I didn't, I didn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if you don't know the four noble truths, then, then um, I think this. Um, I think uh, you know. I, I was having a little bit hearing problem, Justin. I, I really hope you can make this thing tomorrow, this stage speaker work. You know. But not right now. No, we're almost done tonight, but tomorrow. And because um, it was somehow difficult. But um, then you need to know this, this Eightfold Path and also what Mark was talking about, about meditating. Uh, and uh, mindfulness was the main thing you were meditating about, right? But mindfulness is the kind of um, Wisdom side of the meditating, actually, really, because samadhi, you know, the, in the Eightfold Path, the concentration, the last one, samadhi, if, that's, if concentration is the right translation for samadhi, which is a, it, it is the usual translation, um, is just one point, like completely drilling down, kind of, and one, without any kind of movement around. In other words, mindfulness is noticing and, and being aware of things. But um, the, what the Eightfold Path is, is the fourth noble truth. So the first noble truth, right, is you all know that no, truth of suffering, or dukkha, what is hard to face, as, he, as Mark put it, dukkha. Dukkha can just mean pain also, simply pain. And um, its opposite is sukha, which can also be simply pleasure, but there's all different levels and kinds. And that's the first noble truth. So the first noble truth is people wrongly think that it is uh, that all life is suffering, and uh, and here you know, but that's wrong from Buddha's point of view. Unenlightened life is suffering. Remember, Socrates said. Everyone knows what Socrates said, right? He said the unexamined life is not worth living. At least that's the English translation of the Greek, <laughs> and. Uh, Buddha never said the unenlightened life is not worth living. He thinks it's highly worth, especially if you're lucky enough to be human and intelligent and free and able to think about such things, which not every human can. And uh, so, so he doesn't. Uh, so, but he means that he said that the unenlightened life will be suffering, will be painful, uh, because he discovered that the enlightened life is not painful. That's the third. So the second noble truth is then the analysis, the cause of the suffering, which is this identity habit, self-habit, self-preoccupation. There's a whole bunch of, that's the root one. Although in his first teaching, he said desire was, because he hadn't read your book, like <laughs> being open to desire. <laughs> he hadn't read Mark's book. So he said desire was in his first teaching. But then later he amended that, or rather he deepened that by saying that that uh, the, the root of the desire, even, is the false sense of self, the false self-definition. And um, uh, he, he taught the teaching of selflessness, which then, then there's a lot of talk about self. And early on, psychiatrists, before Mark, BM, in, in America, <laughs> BM, before Mark, psychiatrists were very nervous about Buddhism and Hinduism, this sort of thing, generally what they thought of as Eastern things, because uh, I guess they'd lump Taoism in there, because they thought that the Eastern people, it fit with a racist Western idea that Eastern people didn't have a sense of individualism. Non-Euro-American uh, people had no sense of individuality. This was a Western racist thing. Like General Westmoreland at Wesleyan College once got eggs thrown at him by the brave and appropriate Wesleyan students for saying that why were they so upset about Vietnam? Because Oriental people didn't, you know, didn't value life much, so it wasn't a big deal for them to die. <laughs> and he got hit with some eggs, which apparently was a big deal for him because he was very individualistic. And if he hadn't known he was there by not being individualistic, maybe he wouldn't have minded. 
And supposedly Asian people didn't know they were there. <laughs> so, so then the Western, really, this is only 20 years, like, well, actually now 50 years ago, 45 years ago. When I started teaching, people said to me that Buddhism had no ethics and things like, the, things like that. Why? Well, because they didn't have a self, Asian people. They didn't know they were there, kind of. So they couldn't restrain themselves from doing bad things and do good things, which is what you have to have ethics has to be, like a kind of restraint uh, p uh, series of rules and regulations, they thought. So they thought they were saying that Buddhism didn't have ethics. You know, That was like a truism. Like, I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, you know that sort of thing. It wasn't like a big insight for them. It was like normal. So because of that, psychiatrists thought that people who were doing Eastern things in general, not just Buddhism, were trying to lose their ego. And since they were... Psychiatry's job is making people who think they're nobody think, won't think they're somebody, so they can be a nice, productive citizen and vote Republican or something. Then, <laughs> then uh, they uh, they were very frightened that if everybody did all this meditation, they would all be, they wouldn't even know how to go and take a pee. <laughs> they'd have to wear diapers or something. They wouldn't know how to cross the street. They'd have they wouldn't know they were there. They'd be like those poor Asian people, you know. <laughs> who all got conquered by the British and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the French because they didn't have a self. You know, the Asian people are like, we don't even know you're there. Like, why me? I'm a Tibetan. So it's such a nonsense. It's just unbelievable. That was a racist thing, you know. So then Buddha is always talking about the self and the person does this, the self, like the arrow, and they do that, and they concentrate, the one of this little mind, and his self is going to be okay. <laughs> so he's constantly talking about self, but then he says this, self is selfless. Oh, that's oriental wisdom. We don't make sense. Or they don't have reason either. <laughs> okay, we got that. So the point is, Four Noble Truths is very reasonable, and they are very reasonable, and they know very much they have ego. It's not a Western ego thing. You know, then on the other hand, the same racist people, they think then, oh, Chinese people, they can't lose face. You can't, don't talk to them. Don't tell them that the Dalai Lama is nice or the Tibet should be free. They'll get really upset. Because they can't lose face. But that's what we say about a five-year-old has tantrums, mm -hmm. right? Losing face because the mommy and daddy didn't do something, you know. I, I saw you were having your teeth crunching thing in mm here. -hmm. <laughs> Separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense, you know. Anybody can't lose face. You know, any egotistical person can't lose face. Look at Trump. Is he oriental? <laughs> it's the East Bronx, you know. And you can't say a word in criticism of that guy. He goes completely nuts, you know. He calls in the Nazis to get you. <laughs> so, so my point is, the first noble truth says, if you're going to be chasing your ego around, or rather, if you're the servant of your own ego, then you will suffer. He only said that because he discovered that if the ego is your servant, rather than your its servant, because if you know what it is, and you know that you're more than your ego, then... You're happy, actually. That's nirvana. That's that, when he discovered that, then he said, oh, if you don't have that understanding and you're being driven around by it, then you will suffer. Because you'll, do all, you'll be, have all kinds of emotions. You'll get really furious when, you're, when your mom does something that you didn't like. Right? You'll bite that nipple. And then you'll get a smack if she's a smart mom, or she'll like flick your cheek like that to show you, since you didn't know that, you know, that nipples are not to be bitten. A smart mom goes a little bit like that, rather than freak out and have a, like a storm and dry and run to her shrink and whatever, and take the baby to the shrink like, what do I do? I just bit my nipple. Right? I read Dr. Spock, or I don't know what you read nowadays. Winnicott. Right? Winnicott. You read, you read Winnicott. I'm sorry? You read Winnicott. Oh, uh, Winnicott. Winnicott. Right, right. That's right. Yeah. And then you read Winnicott, and you discover the 18 reasons why you should hate your baby. <laughs> <laughs> and then you don't do them. Anyway, so my point is that Buddha's thing is nothing but a diagnosis and a thing. But then the key thing, this is the key thing that you tend to miss, everyone. We all do in our culture. By you were saying it, like my version of it. We are taught that we're in a really bad situation. We really are. The Judeo-Christian thing, it's like hell is there, like dark space. Then, then the materialist, Chan Darwin, hated that. His daughter died, so what the hell with the church? He's like, no soul, just some genes are doing this. Because there's no, 
you know, there's no, there's no soul to escape from that bad situation that the churches put everybody in, you know. That, uh, you know, they said, God is great, God is good, God is nice, but he doesn't like you because you, <laughs> you are a sinner. And you didn't do what, uh, what they say, you know. You're not as perfect saint. You know? so, so that we had that. And then, they, then we've gotten away from that for a century or so, the educated people. But we still have this situation where we are all nothing, right? If we don't run around and maintain some sort of identity, then we'll be nothing. Because we're, actually, we are really nothing. When you die, you're going to be returned to the nothing which you actually are. Because you you're just a biological robot. And you're not even working for yourself. You're working for your genes. And you're taking genes and dumping them over here. Taking them from here and dumping them over there. And when you die, it's all over. And if you did a good dump or a bad dump, once you're dead, you don't care. Because <laughs> you don't even know you're there. And then the way you dump them, you don't really care about my kids yet, so I have to worry. And, I don't want to have a nuclear waste to lie, you know, under their bed and so on. But, but once they're dead, they don't know they ever lived either. So that's fine. But it's very scary, too, to be nothing. Oh, I'm so scared of nothing. Actually, there's a guy, you know, Barry Curzon? You don't know him. No. He's the Dalai Lama's Western physician, and he's a Buddhist monk. And he loves Buddhism, and he's been for 40 years a monk. He's been 20 years. And he was a doctor, though, MD doctor. And when it, one of his breakthrough, big breakthrough experiences was, from hearing about selflessness, was he kept having this uh, either fantasy, and he would dream about it, and he had it waking, that he climbed up to the top of a, like a teepee. And in his book, which I'm trying to edit for him a little bit, he spells it T-E-E-P-E-E, -E -E -E, <laughs> teepee. So I think that's something for you to analyze. Yeah. I, I put in comma, but T-I-P-I, T -I -P -I, you know, that's what he did. Not T-E-E-P-E-E. -E -E -E. But he really did that. Well, then he's looking down in the teepee, and, and then he says, I knew when I was doing it that that was myself. And then he has an abyss of nothingness there in the teepee, and he was terrified. His blood pressure went up, he fainted. They took him down, they packed him in ice. I mean, he had a complete freak out in Nepal. You know, when, around before he was a monk, you know. That was his big breakthrough thing. So he had the visceral experience of fearing nothing, mm. right? I mean, really, mm -hmm. physiologically going through terror, which is a very good thing to do, actually. That's a good sign that, you know, because eventually you kind of get the point that there's nothing to be afraid of, because mm. it's nothing. Mm. <laughs> so that's the big trick that materialists do to themselves. They act like they're really brave. And then everybody who talks about former and future life is some fanatic, religious weirdo who didn't go to science class, you know? So they send them over for STEM studies, right? Because they didn't have enough science in their education, so they're still thinking, that I might be somewhere after I die, that's all crazy. And that neuroscientist, Eben Alexander, they all hate him. He's like, they have him, in the, but they're going to burn him at the stake eventually in Harvard Square because he died. He had a virus or something, and he manifested flatline for hours. It was like a coma, but no, but no, no part beat and no brain scan, nothing. He was dead, therefore. And then he revived from that, and he had a huge thing, went to heaven, and wrote a big book about mm -hmm. him. Bestseller, even that really pissed him off. <laughs> and and, uh, and they, they, he was a heretic, in other words. Because he was out of, the, he had a non, his brain was not working, but he had experience. So they all say, oh, well, it was in a split second before the brain stopped, and then it was in the split second when it started. It all happened, because, of course, you have to have the brain. It only is the brain that uses your consciousness. There's nothing outside the brain, they say. And that's the proof that you're not going to be reborn, that you have no soul, is that when, they, when you're a dead corpse, they're going to come and put an fMRI on you, and nothing's going to happen. So that, see, I told you all along, you never had a mind. You never had a soul. There's nothing to you other than your body. But wait a minute, what's the difference then when you're dead and alive? Well, that's elect some electricity or something. <laughs> Point is, the only thing that bothers you, you don't have to believe in former and future life. It's OK. You can be a neuroscientist and be happy, and uh, never mind. But <laughs> there's evidence for the future and former life. If you're a scientist, you should examine the evidence. 
they all act, and even I know certain Buddhists who go around acting like, oh, it's just a leap of faith. It is not a leap of faith. It is uh, something that one comes to have an understanding of by examining the evidence. You can examine, and there's all kinds of ways. There's reasoning, A and B, and then there's examination of evidence. And I even know a great book by a woman who was trying to, uh, it was a book to, to denigrate and to mark the idea of future life. And it's called Mary something, but I forgot her last name. I'm meaning to correspond with her for decades mm -hmm. since I read the book. Because so, I love the book. It's called Spooks. And then they marry something. And, but you can find it in, the, in Amazon. Spooks, it's called the title. And uh, she even follows these kids who remember previous lives, you know, in India and in someplace. Some of them in, in uh, Lebanon. They're, they're not necessarily cultures that automatically believe that. And she follows them around and she sees them. Here's the accounts of all the people about how their memory of their previous life in this other family in another city with a different language, because India is a multi multilingual, multinational subcontinent, not a country. And, uh, and then she says, you know, it was almost convincing. But you know, the thing is, is that nobody could ever explain to me the mechanism of how it could work. So therefore, I still can't buy it, even though this seems completely real to me. So she tried to look at the evidence. And she then just dismissed it, though, however, still based on, because nobody could explain the mechanism. And she never read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. That clearly explains the mechanism. And again, that can be rejected. But they won't even look at it. Because why? Because underneath, you're, and I know this because of my grandfather. When I became a Buddhist monk, my grandfather was already something like 90, 92. And I knew him very well, because he'd lived with our family for the previous 15, 20 years. Ever since I was born, I remember him as part of the household. And he was a completely confirmed materialist. He was absolutely dead set. He was just going to die, and that was that. But he was going to make 100, because no one in the family that he knew of had ever made 100. So he was going to do it. <laughs> so he was working on it. He only made 97. But he did a good solid 97. <laughs> but at 93, we had these kind of discussions. And finally, he realized that it wasn't that he was afraid of nothing. He was looking forward comfortably to the idea of the, the eternal sleep. He was afraid of something, and he didn't know what. That's, you know, the horror movie. When you go to the horror movie, or Alien, once you see the weird mechanism, sort of metallic, green-blooded, weird, like spooky-looking, pterodactyl-looking creature, well, OK, you're going to fight it off, and Sigourney's going to get in a, in a thing, robot, beat it up, and have a big fight. And it's not very scary. It's just a fierce-looking thing. But when you're in the dark space going down the hall, <laughs> then something coming. And then that's when you're scared. It's what might come and happen, right? That, that's when my kids used to put a bag of popcorn in my hand. And then when the thing jumped out, I would throw it. <laughs> that's one of their favorite things, my kids. Because I don't like horror movies, and they used to drag me to them. I know, I know I'm going to stop, and don't give me that look. <laughs> so point is, point is, that there is evidence. You can examine it. You can reject it. But sort of this blanket thing that we know, and this is really, you know, you said you're the scientist. They think they know that there's no future life. It's not possible. And it can only be a religious or a superstitious idea, OK? But let me ask you this. How would anybody know that anybody else had nothing in their consciousness after they died? Who could ever discover that? I like to tease when I'm speaking to a group of scientists. I say, did Carl Sagan come back and say, guys, it's cool. I really am nothing. <laughs> will he ever come back and say that? Uh, will anybody ever discover nothing and prove it to everybody else? Actually not, right? It's the one thing nobody can ever discover. Am I, am I right? You can't find nothing. It isn't there. So no one will ever discover it. Therefore, to believe that you will become it, your consciousness, continuum of awareness, will become nothing, has to be blind faith belief. How about that for superstition and religion? No evidence possible. It's not that there's no evidence now. There never will be evidence. I know one neuroscientist at Bellevue, a Latino guy, very nice man, white coat, the whole thing, but you know, kind of emotional, volatile, I think, Venezuelan or Argentinian, Colombian. And he, he said, well, I, 
I tested dead bodies. There was no activity in there. So therefore, I know there, there's no consciousness after death. You know, there's no thing. That's why the person is dead. <laughs> consciousness <laughs> left. <laughs> we know that. That didn't prove that they are not experiencing anything. Just to prove that they left their body. Right? And then maybe there is nothing other than the body. Maybe so. But, you know, it's like even, you know, in scientific physical theory. I was so shocked. Energy and mass, what's the difference? E equals mc squared, right? Energy equals mass, speed of light squared. It sounds all very neat. Wow, Einstein. C squared is 186,000 miles a second speed of light squared. That's probably a lot of, that's a huge number. So if you take mass and you blow it up by 186,000 by times 186,000, then you have energy, which has no mass. And yet it moves things around. How does something with no mass hit, like billiard ball-wise, something with mass and move it? Well, it has to explode. And yet energy is, is allowed to be real, right? without having mass. And they were even so freaked out about the abyss of emptiness not having mass that they saw they were worried that everything was had no mass. So then they ran around, spent billions of dollars and, and decades, and they came up with the Higgs boson. Just the other day, it was in all the papers, right? He, right? Do you have a, sense, a good sense of the Higgs boson? Do you think they can pick up a Higgs boson? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's just some byproduct of something mathematically because it blew up in a cloud chamber after being running around in a, in a huge giant magnet subway made of magnets at like 10 zillion miles a second. And some inference, therefore, that's a Higgs boson. And then, that's all, then there's dark energy and dark matter, which nobody's ever seen yet. And there's 97% of the universe. Bri this is all really brilliant. And there's nothing, there's no non-evidence thing in that. <laughs> Nothing superstitious there. <laughs> so, okay, anyway, I don't want to terrorize you. You're going to go home, go to sleep. We're all going to stop. <coughs> tie it back. And you're going to become back, unconscious. Tie it back to the Four Noble Truths. What? Just bring it back to the Four yeah, Noble so, Truths. Yeah, so, that, yeah, that's what I was going to do. Right. So, <laughs> the third Noble Truth is Nirvana. And Nirvana is not anywhere else. And Nirvana also is not at the same plane. It's not on a par with the suffering cause of suffering, and the Eightfold Path, the way to reach beyond the suffering by becoming enlightened. Those are on the level of the relative reality. Nirvana is the real reality, like ultimate reality, like absolute reality. Okay? And that one is freedom from suffering, and that's the only one that's really real. The others are somewhat real, but less real. You follow? So that's the Buddha's good news. And so we, this bad situation, in other words is not the case according to the Buddha, which is why he was so popular. <laughs> he, he announced that everything is all right, uh, ultimately, cosmically. But that means ultimately right here and now. If we really knew what was here and now, we'd know it was nirvana, in other words. Although some people, that was so completely improbable to some people, he let them think, these are mainly the Theravada people, Nowadays, there was all 18 different kinds of them in the past, ancient time. He let them think that he couldn't imagine that this would be perfectly all right. It was unimaginable because they have a pain in their foot, an arthritic pain in their thumb joint or something. And how can it be perfectly all right? And I have so much pain and there's so much problem and I'm so lonely and this, that, I'm going to die and whatever. So they couldn't imagine. So he let them think that nirvana was some place they, they could go else. Like people make, you know, have these heavens that they go to and happy hunting grounds and things. Although they do have these kind of things, actually. But the problem is that people don't get to stay there. It's like temporary, you know. It's like you make some money and you go and have a good time and then you spend it all and you have a bad time. You're homeless. <laughs> you go bankrupt six times like Donald Trump and you're saved by the, <laughs> saved by the Russians. We need, need to launder their money in real estate in New York. So then you're fine. So my point is, here you are in Menla. You can imagine sort of that you're tasting of the Buddhist universe. And we're looking at it in relation to the wonderful thing that is psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. But 
You can imagine, therefore, being in a situation which is basically OK. And this is the sleep yoga of Menla. That's the second yoga of Menla I want to teach you. When you fall asleep, the, the Buddhists have a psychoanalysis that gives you eight stages of dissolving out of your consciousness and, and sort of letting go of your sense impressions, you know, and seeing things and hearing things and smelling, tasting, touching. Your cheek on the pillow is the last thing. And then you're out. Right? But they, and normally, when you're tired, some people go clunk. Some people have a hard time going there. You know, they worry about something, so they, it's a difficult time. Uh, but everyone goes through this process, and they have a certain analysis of that. And there is this phase of darkness and unconsciousness, and which is a blessed relief. We love it, actually. That's one thing. We pretend to be scared of nothing, but at night when we become unconscious, we're very, very happy. Phew, like I don't have to worry about my neuroscience test or my experiment or my lab or whether the, whether the monkey is going to run away somewhere. <laughs> and, and so we're happy. We, after like 16 hours of pursuing the experiment, we're very, very happy. But they teach that there is a deeper state, <coughs> which they call clear light state. And it's actually mistranslated, I think. Although the original word, prabhasara, there is a word light, an ursal in Tibetan. But it's cl the clear of the clear light is more important than the light of the clear light. Clear means transparent. So it's uh, the analogy for it, in the earlier state, there's little flashes of moonlight and sunlight. And then there's an eclipse-like state, which is when you fall asleep, you, that you're in an eclipse, your own eclipse. And then beneath that is this clear light. And the clear light is this, um, like everything is, turns to diamond. Everything becomes transparent. It's the gray pre-dawn twilight, where it's neither bright nor dark. It's like in between light and dark. It's all light and all dark, actually, in perfect balance, but sort of a gray, crystal grayness, if you can say. It's indescribable, actually. And it's, it takes a really intense concentration and study and self-exploration to discover that we have that potential awareness. And when we have that awareness, which we can hold to, then that we become a Buddha, actually. But, so we, have, we become a Buddha every night when we fall asleep. But unfortunately, the barrier of unconsciousness is between that awareness that we all have and our re relative differentiated awareness. It's kind of a, and it seems to be as if it's an ultimate withdrawal, but the clear light is in a mind that is aware of everything. It isn't even, it's not the dream state either. It's something other. It's, but it can encompass the dream state, the waking state, the unconscious state, all of them. It's, it, so it's indescribable. I mean, I can say all these things about it, but it's indescribable. But my point is, that's why you feel refreshed in the morning. If you are lying in a place of darkness and nothingness, why would you feel any better than you do now that you're tired and you wish I'd shut up so you could go to sleep? <laughs> and, and I agree with you. And so, and so the point is that you, this clear light level is the level of infinite energy. And being infinite, it's an energy that doesn't have to do anything, because everything is already done. But anything that needs energy can draw from it infinitely. So there is, in a way, it's beyond any kind of heaven or hell. It's, it's a nirvana state. So when you fall asleep, the, the, the yoga of men love sleeping is, as you fall asleep, and then you reach the blessed unconsciousness, just ahead of time, create an auto-suggestion that, oh, I'm looking forward to slipping past the dark state into clear light state so that when I rise from it, I'm going to be completely renewed and refreshed and really happy. And I, I'm not pressing myself. I won't, I won't be disappointed that I'm not super conscious in that state. But I'm just going to know that I'm going there. And I will, when I return I, back up through the dark state and then into the waking state, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to feel great. OK? So I'm going to be falling asleep, and I'll be sleeping in the third noble truth, in other words. In the clear light of the void, we call it sometimes. Sometimes we call it bliss void indivisible. All kind of expressions, but basically it's indescribable. Actually, the quantum people have a similar thing, I think. They call it the zero quantum point field, 
where they, where they discover that the vacuum has this infinite potential energy for some reason, mathematically. It's like the zero and the infinity sign are like connect to each other to their surprise through some method, and they don't know quite what to make of that. But it's, it's like that, something like that. Okay, so thank you very much. Good night, thank you, Mark. And I'm gonna get more of your advice, not given it to you, I'm gonna get more <laughs> of it tonight, I'm gonna read it. And uh, we'll be ready tomorrow, 9.30, okay? And uh, tomorrow we'll, we'll try to work on self and selflessness, which is the root of what I call self-addiction and how to overcome all these addictions. Get it, like getting over yourself, that's to overcome self-addiction, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean, so the getting over self-addiction doesn't mean getting over having no self and like not knowing what's right and left, you know? It doesn't mean that. But it means, it means enjoying right and left rather than worrying about it, something like that. Maybe. Maybe that's a possibility. What do you think? Sleep tight. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.